Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the eastern border. What a bit later this month because, well, I've picked up a day job again, and I also played through another game, which I was given by uh, our good old friends at Atom RPG. Yeah, that'll get a Minnesota of its own because uh, we'll have a tiny little contest and stuff, but I want to get back to, you know, the things that I've been promising you for a long while, and this time this concerns the Soviet school system. Another reason why this is, uh, well, a week later than usual is because I've been spending some time actually traveling to people once again. Although that's gonna go over soon again, because starting from this Monday, we have extra COVID lockdowns again in place in Latvia due to the large amount of anti-vaxxers here and people who just refuse to get vaccinated. Sadly, we are among the lowest countries in Europe. I think we take like the fourth or the fifth place from the end. When it comes to vaccinations, we have about like, what, 52% people vaccinated, so everyone's working from home and, you know, not much of hanging around allowed. However, I did spend quite a lot of time gathering actual stories about how the Soviet school system worked and what the people think and what the people feel about their time at school. Well, this episode was meant to come out earlier, when it was kind of more relevant, I suppose, but still turned out to be an interesting experience, because a lot of people told me quite a few things which you didn't think about. I have made episodes on the Soviet childhood, I think it was 14th or 15th one, one of the early ones that I made, and um, I'll be putting them up in Patreon since some of you asked for it, but there was always this collectivism and there was always this political view on things, but I've covered that before, however, on that episode which I made, I couldn't really do anything about the people's experience. There was always these political classes and everything, and we'll touch upon this, but I wanted to give you some real stories from people who were kids during the Soviet era and how they felt in their well, everyday schools. And maybe, you know, you could compare this to your experience if you're still in school. I know that some of my listeners are. We are we're still working on those shirts and, and our webpage, because, turns out, as we updated WordPress, we need to update the PHP protocols, and that just destroyed all the feed from our webpage as such. Thankfully, we've got ACOST, and, uh, well, yeah, working to get those t-shirts up there, because I know that there's at least one of you who wants to get our t-shirt for his 17-year-old son. Well, hopefully we'll get that in order by the time you listen to this. Can't promise you, though, but we'll try anyways. However, you know, I want you to compare all this experience and all these gathered stories to what your kids experienced, what you experience, and, well, you know, to how it was. Because it was way more, as far as I understood, from all these stories than just propaganda and just how it gets portrayed in, in various Western movies about the Soviet Union. And also way different from, you know, all these portrayals of Soviet schools, even in, that is, Soviet movies. Again, shout out to Rosa Files Unite, uh, Soviet movie podcast. It's a great show, you should check it out. And the Red Line, of course, Red Line's our friends. But yeah, for one, we had our own show called Yeralash. And it was kind of a roundabout, I suppose. It was called Roundabout in English. It's hard to translate it. At least it was for me, because Google Translate didn't throw out any good words for it. Not any ones that would relay the meaning of the word itself. But Yeralash, which kind of means, you know, the fair, the festivity, the roundabout, something... The same thing, really. And I watched this again because it was mostly, you know, a kind of a comedy TV show about the school life and kids. But it was like about tiny school, tiny kids and, and, you know, early years of the school life, like grades six and seven and such. While researching this, I found out that instead of, like, filming at one school... They would just film at various schools, which would look better, and then you find out that half of the episode is filmed in Vilnius, in Lithuania, and the other one is filmed in Tbilisi, which is Georgia, and those, those places are quite the times apart, really. It's a bit scary and a bit weird, but kind of, you know, relates the Soviet reality that didn't really matter where you were. However, I believe that these experiences might be interesting for you, because... You know, I know that a lot of you guys who listen to my show, and by guys I of course mean all genders, I do hate that I have to mention this here though, because I, frankly speaking, can't understand all the political correctness that's going on these days. You know, but have gotten some bad mails about that one too. 
I don't bother really, but just to make everyone happy, I am, uh, how do you say the, 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 these days, uh, gender inclusive? Yeah, I guess those are the words. I, I really uh, believe everyone's sort of equal in this matter, you know. So, um, we're we'll going through some personal experiences, and uh, these stories, they're kind of um, weird, because one thing you have to, you have to realize is that they're all coming from a bit of a rose and tinged glasses, since all the people who talk to me about this and all the people who told me about all this stuff they had some negative memories too but it was mostly tinted in a rose lens flare because you know there were kids at the time and every time you look at the period of history you see these kind of golden eras you see these weird periods where everything just you know tastes better is better is more beautiful you only kind of keep the good memories of your childhood anyways Unless you've had a really terrible childhood, that is, but still. However, the experiences were somewhat similar, and I'd like to call some of them at least, you know, strange. But this is one of those shows where I'd like to put this for your consideration. Yeah, it kind of put me into perspective, because everyone keeps talking about how um, the Soviet education was way better than we have these days. Also, like, here in Latvia and in Russia, it's just the same all over the Soviet Union, and a lot of people keep saying that, you know, back in our days, it was better, the kids were smarter, and they listened to their teachers and all that stuff, and they just keep on giving me all these negatives, all these things which I consider to be a bit shocking, even. Well, some of them less shocking, some of them more shocking, but still quite bizarre. And they keep referring to them as some sort of a positive, with unequivocal voice, unequivocal, oh, I forgot how to English, <clears throat> sorry, unequivocal voice, it seems weird where things that, at least my generation, I'm 32 at this point, you know, not a young kid, but not, you know, in my 40s or 50s, yeah, some things that we would consider oppressive, I suppose, is kind of weird, though. This is one of those makes you think shows. I wish that you'll get something out of this. I wish that you get something out of this for yourself and um, learn a bit. Because all this time, you know, I've been studying about how it was in, this, in the United States, too. Trust me, a lot of you have some emails and books. So this is the Soviet perspective. Bit of an old school show, but really, I thought it would be valuable. See, first off, I want to give you some things that you probably didn't know about the Soviet schools themselves. Just from the historical perspective, it was hard to find those facts, but, you know, some of them existed. As with everything in the Soviet Union, the 1930s and 1920s, the knife period before Stalin came to power, were a time of experimentation. For one, some schools had their physical education fields or whatever built on the roofs. Yeah, you know, kids could go out there and do their gymnastics or play some games directly on the roof to save space. That would often sometimes happen to basically next to their observatory. Yes, because quite a lot of Soviet schools also built observatories there. And that was okay, because quite a lot of these schools were, at that time, built to be huge. They also had cinemas inside of them themselves. But these were considered immensely huge schools for the time, as 2,500 people were supposed to study in such schools. And in a lot of them, you could actually get lost. For this subject, a teacher to kind of to Pravda, one Malinovskaya, kind of complained. And she stated that um, me and the director of the school of number one of the Frunze district of Moscow, I remember that one kid went through the school on the third floor and was just completely crying all the time. He had been lost and couldn't find the needed floor and the needed classroom. Of course, we can't really blame the kid for being irresponsible. It's just that the floors and the corridors and the classrooms are just so, so much similar to each other that you can't really tell them apart. That was the thing, because all the schools basically looked the same. They had these various, you know, paradigm projects. Project 68 was one of the more popular ones, but this kind of idea of building identical schools everywhere, that was one of the things that they actually tried to fix during the Stalin's era, during the five-year plan, which was still kind of crazy, but they did it because previously in the 30s, they tried to do all these experiments. 
For one, they also put in uh, kind of workbenches in a lot of schools in the early 30s, in the early years of the Soviet era. Well, we'll get through this, because once they kind of disassembled the school from the church, they disunited them in the same way as you would disunite the state from the church. In modern countries and everywhere, in the Soviet era, they decided to strictly separate the church from the state, and they decided to basically make sure that we're preparing some factory workers here, so let's do all that stuff. You know, let's make schools like factories, and let's try to introduce factory working even in the classrooms for kids as young as the sixth grade. So, for in the schools built in the 30s, these super huge, massive, well, a lot of people call them Muraveniki. This is how the modern skyscraper term also comes up in modern Russian. Well, these um, ant hill schools, they were just so huge that they would remind you of factories and they would like mentally prepare you for this. There were some experiments on this situation because at the NEP policy, even though the economical policy was kind of getting more progressive, yeah, later on a lot of these schools got repurposed as various institutes or research centers or even military facilities. This just shows you how large these schools were. And the militarization, it touched every aspect of school. For one, there was always discipline. Discipline was kind of a, a part of the Soviet education that you could basically not ignore. And a lot of harsh no's really didn't allow any place for personal choice or self-expression. And harsh, harsh fates really happened to these students who tried to be different, so to speak. There's those people who grew up in the Soviet Union, yeah, all of them have told me that school was just something more than just a place of education. School strictly stated which every Soviet kid should wear, how every Soviet kid should look like, and how to write, and with which hand. People who refused, students who refused, they were hated by the system. And to give an example, a bit more radical example for all of the situation, we have an article from the Soviet Latvia, originally printed in the October 17th, 1940. The article's called, We Must Eliminate the Criminal Specifics in Schools. And it states, and I'll, I'll quote here, translation by me, it's found in historia.lv, so just so you know. In the Riga City Second High School, all the directors and pollet inspectors and all the overseers and their advisors and the teachers of the political work came together. Together with them, the Komsomol, the Communistic Youth Union representatives at schools, and the elder leaders of the pioneers arrived as well to listen to the <clears throat> People's Commissar of the Education, Ye Latsis, most likely Janis Latsis, or uh, in English, John the Bear, which is fun, fun already because Janis is basically John, but still. Yeah, and he gave them some um, some nice guidelines, I guess, in, in, in the terms of making people be good communists. There's a long list there, whichever people from the Communist Party arrived at this meeting as well, and a long list of people who are all fanatical Stalinists, like I said, it's 1940. However, the meaningful part of this whole article is that um, the teachers are still not reaching their peak and they're not doing their assigned tasks, which is necessary for a Soviet school. The speaker specifically stated that the Marxistic class attitude needs to be encouraged and enforced in all questions of growing the new Soviet man. And also, the thing is that they speak about the criminal students. Criminal students are not the ones that would, you know, sell drugs or booze or whatever around schools. No, no, no. In this case, in our specific case, these students are these people who still hold... It's 1940, and, uh, yeah, 1940 August, three months before this, the Soviets occupied our country. The criminals are those people who have... Uh, mm, still going forth and supporting the old bourgeoisie regime and not friendly to everyone. We still have a lot of working class people, working class students who have not gained access to our schools. Those students who still support the old regime 
together with their families, shall be sent to Siberian gulags where they shall learn their lessons. The young kids of the proletariat shall instead take their places, for a lot of them have not received education. Yeah, you know, we had uh, our own fair share of collaborationists. But then, what was this control? And what was this political method and motive? Because, you know, you, you can't really tell the, some kid at, say, 7th grade that now he needs to be a totally hardcore communist. Oh no. You grow that into him. Slowly. Hello there. Thank you for tuning in into another episode of The Eastern Border. We are so happy to announce that this episode is brought to you by our friends at Rusansov.com. If you're looking to buy new art, don't forget to use the code Eastern Border for a discount on us. Remember, head over to Rusansov.com and happy shopping! If, however, you want to support our show directly, head over to Patreon.com or our website TheEasternBorder.lv to find out how you can help out. For all things Eastern Border, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Discord. And as always, thank you so much for supporting us, we really appreciate each and every one of you. That's all from me now, see you online! This podcast brought to you by RussianVoiceOvers.eu. Enjoy! Well, first things first. If you were left-handed, well then, tough luck. Up until 1985-1986, there were no left-handed people in the Soviet schools. Just like sex, no left-handedness. At least not officially, of course. See, everyone who were left-handed were forced to write in, you know, their right-handed manner. See, there was a view that in the future, you know, in their workspaces, whatever, it would be hard for left-handed people to work and um, fight the dirty capitalists, because all the weapons were made for right-handed people, and all the equipment for various production methods and everything as it was standardized. So, there was a bit of a war against left-handedness. Because, you know, the left-handed people could only either fight this or just obey. And uh, I had this nice little quote here. My dad was left-handed. He was re-qualified. They were beating him with a ruler. When I started writing with the left hand and the teacher stated that I will be requalified, I told them to shut off. I'm still requalified. This is a comment that I got from my question on social media. And this is kind of weird because, seriously, left-handed people were considered an abomination and they were re-qualified again by, you know, beatings. Beatings shall continue until morale improves, as usual. Another thing was ballpens. See, Soviets considered that ballpens are the enemy of a beautiful handwriting, therefore they were prohibited until the kid would learn how to write with some grace. This was a short-term thing, though, and was used only at the beginning of education. But here I have a quote from a person who stated that, quote, mm. We were all using the ink pencil, ink pen for a while. At the beginning, from the fountain pens which we put in into our ink holders, disregarding the fact how accurate and balanced you are, you still can't really avoid blotting your table or, or notepad. And later, you had these cane pens or something, the ones that you could actually squeeze and get the ink inside the pen and then write it that way, but you always had to write with the pen, and to make the writing go faster, you would use the blotter paper. So the kids would be forced to write with ink pens, even though the ball pens were always available. And at the same time, all the writing utensils, they were also very basic, made from worst quality paper of all times. But one thing that strikes my mind is the fact that, still, forcing left-handed kids to write right-handed just for the sake of it is quite weird, However, if you think about it, well, maybe we should also do something about the ballpen category, since, as far as people told me, that was one of the reasons why they still have a good, you know, handwriting there. Another person tells me, 
named Sergei. Quote, I am 48 years old. In the first grade we were forced to write with an ink pen. That was a wooden stick with a holder where the pen was put in. We had our ink holders and the blotting paper. We had to write our tests and everything that we needed to write in our language classes to get a certain amount of fours and fives so that the teacher could individually allow you to move to a ball pen. Yeah, fours and fives are like high grades because the Soviets used the five grade system from one to five, one being the lowest. And everyone before 1985, all everyone who went to the grade one, to grade five, had to get a permission from their teacher to use a ball pen, because otherwise you could only use ink to improve your handwriting. Which also kind of matters a lot to me since um since my grandfather died, and I've I've read his papers through and through, and they you know been used in this show quite a lot, and I read through his own master's degree you know, master's work, master's thesis. And that's all handwritten. And it's all written in such a beautiful handwriting that I can understand this fact that you needed to work out a beautiful way how to write, which is totally lost these days since we all basically use computers anyways. Now, is this a necessary skill? No, but it's definitely a beautiful one that you should kind of cherish, I suppose. Enforced, however, uh, I don't think so. That was another thing. Everything besides your school uniform was prohibited, because every kid in this USSR had to wear a school uniform. Jeans, sweaters, any type of dresses with any type of coloring, even colorful decorations for your hair, nope, all that's gone. Standardization was accepted in the Soviet schools and adopted in insane degrees. Everyone had to look the same. This reached absurd levels. For example, if someone entered the room with new shoes, new sort of sneakers even, he could have gotten lectured in front of the old class, or his parents even could be called to visit the school and, you know, make him responsible for his acts of, of everything. All students were supposed to feel utterly equal. The fact is that in the Soviet Union, real actually sneakers and boots were only for the select few. For those whose parents could allow themselves to go to foreign countries either for work or with a special permit. The complete majority wore the very old, very same Soviet sneakers and, and shoes and everything. Because they were super common and everything, but if you had foreign shoes, yeah, you could be punished for that. Also, any and other form of cosmetics were prohibited. You weren't allowed to paint your nails, paint your hair and paint your face. If you had any of these, you could get thrown out of your classroom and be subjected to public shaming. For example, if your guy's hair were too long, this meant that your Soviet teachers would treat you as a hippie. Sometimes that could lead even to investigations in school, although in the late 80s that would only be considered educational, and sometimes even a funny thing in the school life. However, a teacher that I interviewed stated that <clears throat> you're lucky to live these days. The principal in the years of my father personally cut his hair about three times. And I also had to cut a guy's hair once in front of the old school in the school meeting. And this was always weird because this also got to absurds. One Yulia Shikhovtseva remembers that, quote, I always had these thick, dark eyelashes. She's from Uzbekistan, so her eyes are kind of Asian looking. She always had these very intense eyes, but for some reason they started to pay them specific attention during the high school. The teachers thought that I have put a lot of eyeliner on my eyes and, you know, toned up my eyelashes. But, you know, if you would know how many times they just dragged me out of the classroom and sent me to the bathroom so that I would wash away non-existing eyeliner from my eyes. Yeah, even if your eyes looked like they had eyeliner on them or something like that, you probably would have, would have gotten thrown out. And this is crazy, because everyone could get, well, thrown out for everything. And I've heard a lot of stories about the fact that how in, in the Western countries sometimes hippies were related to more socialist tendencies or whatever. No, no, no. Here, in the Soviet Union, Hippies and punks and all that stuff, that's pure capitalism. Those are the evil capitalists trying to ruin their kids. So, that happened, and that's a nice little story about whether or not some sort of free-spiritedness would be allowed.
And finally, of course, the surefire way how to piss off your teacher was to get an earring. Or a piercing, which was even worse. And, uh, yeah, from very humble, almost unseeable earrings for girls, yeah, you know, those would just get thrown out in the trash, or even worse, in the sink or whatever, or just flush down the toilet, but anything else could even cause violent reactions. Quote, In 1989, when the underground music scene in the country was popular and widespread, there were students who well, thought themselves as metalists, or punks, or metalheads, or whatever, or rockers. And I had a punk in my class. He looked very common at school, the only thing that really gave him away was long hair, and not even that long, really. But one day, he showed up with an earring, and that earring was a cross. And that was a history lesson, where um, an old-school communist historian had arrived. And then she saw the cross and started mumbling, and then she almost lost consciousness out of the sheer shock of how a Soviet man can have an earring, a guy no less. Well, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, this is something that the modern left have to understand, that no, the communists don't care about your identity politics. In fact, communists were as much against identity politics as humanly possible. You were all equal. So why modern life today is obsessed with all sorts of weird stuff like your individuality and all that stuff. No, no, it's all, it's all economical. It's all Marx is just purely economical. If, if you read Marx, he doesn't care about, you know, all the other stuff. Only thing he cares about is the economical things. So, and the real communists, obviously, as you can see here, because they are all old school revolutionaries, they hated all this individual expression because that goes against collectivism. Which is why I'm so confused sometimes when I read political news about all this identity politics stuff. It just annoys me to no end because I fully don't believe that those people even even know what communism is. But that's around, however. This old lady had seen this cross and and then she started yelling, demanding violently to take out the earring. However, the pun guy peacefully said, well, just no. The teacher then walked up to him, tore the earring out of his ear, and sent him out of the classroom. This is what you get for, uh, you know, not being socialistically uh, confirmist enough. Yeah, once again, you can clearly see that if you're worrying that your socialist education, wherever Western country you live in, is getting too socialist, yeah, it'll be socialist when everyone's becoming the same, when they're starting to rip off earrings and whatever from kids' ears or whatnot. Anything else... No, man, it's just... To, to me, it just seems that there's a lot of people around these days who are just pretending to be socialist and they have no idea about what, you know, real socialism means. Of course, they'll yell at me for me not being a real socialist, but hey, one, I'm not a socialist, and two, still, for one, if there was any real socialism, then in my mind, that was Leninism. And this, this, comrades, is how Leninist schools worked. But yeah, I hope you enjoy these school studies and a bit of philosophy. Really hadn't had enough time because I've moved to Riga and I'm doing a lot of things and interviews are down now. But here you go. Those were some of the studies from the Soviet era about how people actually studied at schools and how it went for them. So if you want to leave a comment, please go to theeasternbar.lv. We're going to fix it up soon. Visit us on social media. Please become our patron. All the good stuff. Uh, visit the Eastern Board LV just to click on the donate button. Hey, we appreciate your donations. This is basically my second job now because, like I said, I was quite forced to take up uh, an actual day job since, well, times are tough and life's not good for anyone. However, I wish you all the best and uh, see you next week. Das Vidanya, Tavarish. And happiness is mandatory. Oh, and one more thing, one more thing. We're gonna have a mini-sode too. Check that out. We have a contest. You can get a free video game. We have a few copies of that going on. And those are my friends of the Atom RPG. Those of you who've received Atom RPG or, or who bought it, please do. That's so it's Fallout, basically. But yeah, see you next week. Or hear you next week, more like. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to the Eastern Border Show. If you have any questions or comments, go to our website, theeasternborder.lv, and leave a comment there. Or email us at theeasternborder at gmail.com. We'll be sure to answer. You can also follow us on social media and contact us there. If you enjoyed this episode, then leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about us. It really helps us grow the show. And remember, happiness is mandatory.